ask me what what would what would make me happy seeing now that I've told I, I have been told by the doctors there's nothing else I'm not going to go into my illness everybody that needs to know knows my illness right it's not curable I'm on a lot of treatment and medication I mightn't be around that long but yeah I think the, the, the best thing that ever could happen in my life for me now is for the truth to come out about that priest. It was very hard. It was very, very hard to live because I was trying to live two separate lives. I was trying to live the life as me, a nice girl that never happened to, was never abused, and the girl that was abused, and I suppose that's where the inner child comes in. Even though he's dead, I, I want to clear his name. And I want the truth that I gave to the police and the truth that I gave to the Archdiocese and Archbishop Barton to come out about that priest. That priest never abused me, ever, ever abused me, never. He never put his finger on me. It was very hard. It, we, we were innocent and we were playing on the street all night and nothing could have happened to us. We were locked outside the place. That was our punishment. That was the day. But I can tell you here now, before God, that that priest never put his hand on me. And yes, I would like to clear that up. That would be, that would be the most, probably, most important thing. God knows, but I want that file and that paper that was taken by the police to be printed somewhere. I don't care where it's printed. And to clear that man's name. And to, and to clear me. Because they're not, they weren't my words. Because that's not what's in the police reports. And them reports were taken years and years and years ago. Innocence of a child is the most sacred thing that you could ever have. And when that innocence is taken away from you, it's gone. It's, it's gone forever. It's like that somebody just reaches deep inside your gut and pulls it out. Well, family means a lot to me, but... I don't have my immediate family. We broke up a long time ago over um, issues in the family with abuse. And so I guess sad now. <laughs> into my full history but Sharon and the grandchildren means the world to me I love them very much and they love me very much and she supports me 100% and as you know that I had two girls that died and then there was Sharon and Sharon came back to my life after years and years and years I can't tell her part of the story I can only tell mine to be glad for the time we have. I mean, yesterday is gone. Tomorrow is not here yet. We don't even have this evening. We only have right now this minute. We're all racing and running for tomorrow and what we're getting and how much money you have and what you're going to buy and how many holidays you're going on. You never think of right now. We actually have the precious present and that's now, right now, this minute. Well, family to me means 
good friends, which I have very good friends. Um, the Lord is a big part of my life. Uh, I left the Catholic Church years and years ago, and I became a Christian. When I was put into the homes at a very young age, and I went to the industrial schools, Kilmacud Industrial School, and I went to m many uh, places, including Madeline Landry's and uh, a hostel for girls, uh, I became better, very bitter, bitter and angry, because I lost a childhood. But I had lost my childhood ever before I went to those places because of abuse and I was put in there into these homes to protect me from abuse and I was abused more when I went into those homes. So yeah, over the years I became very um, angry and bitter and I just hated everything and everyone. Nothing, nothing was right in my life. But I'm not saying because I became a Christian that everything came right in my life. It didn't. I just got older and I suppose you get more sense and, and you look back on your life and you say, well, that part of my life was destroyed, but I can, I can carry on with this part of my life. Life is a funny thing. Anyway, yeah. That and, and, and my little girl dying, I suppose. Hard. But she's in a better place. So she is. I know she's safe and no one will ever hurt her again where she is. So I suppose I am heartbroken but thankful. But she'll never go through what I went through or what any, anyone else went through. So yeah, you just keep praying. I was abused in um, one of the homes I was in and I became pregnant and I had my daughter Annie uh, a month before my 14th birthday and Annie was born on the Navan Road, St. Patrick's in the Navan Road and she stayed there for so many months and then I went back to the laundries to work. I was in Stan Hope Street for one year and then I was in another Magdalene laundry. And then I was in a, a third Magdalene laundry. All in all, I was in five different homes. Annie lived until she was 10. And she was on drug trials from the age of two. And she died because of the drug trials. I don't hold grudges, I did. I don't hold grudges now. I just let it all go. Because at the end of the day, I feel like just because I've left the Catholic Church, I couldn't be controlled by the Catholic Church anymore. My mom was controlled by the Catholic Church. Them people in the, that back in the day was controlled by the Catholic Church. Even if you were never in any institution, you were controlled by the Catholic Church. They just thought they were God. But what they forgot was, they're not God. Nobody controls me, not even the Lord, because the Lord gave me free will and a mind of my own to do. It's like he says, go, you know, do. I've given you what you need and the tools. It's like giving a builder tools to build a house. 
He either builds it or he doesn't build it. So I feel the Lord has given me free will, free mind. So you can go and do good with it or you can do bad with it. So I do good with it. I'm not really afraid of anything. I worry. Everybody worries. I get upset, I get down, I get depressed. But I mean, you don't have to be a survivor of institutional abuse to have all those things going in your, on in your life. Other people has them. There's stress in the world. We're living in a, a corrupt world, a, a, an awful world. But no, I, I don't have any fears. Um, I have fears that I won't be able to do everything that I've always wanted to do and wished to do because of my illness. I just hope I get enough the time to do all the things. I've done a good few of them. I just felt that the stories had to be told. I only told my own story, but I, I did it in the hope that I was speaking up for other people. And then there was a lot of backlash and anger. But at the end of the day, I feel I told what was right and the truth is out now and everybody knows it's the truth. One day, sooner or later, I'm going to have to meet the Lord, you know, and my conscience will be clear. I did what was right. My mom had so many regrets before she died. She often said it to me. She remembered the day you destroyed me coat. <laughs> destroyed your coat, I said. I was fighting for my life. Uh, once a month, there was 10 babies taken in a taxi from the mother and baby home that I had my daughter in and they were driven to Belfast and maybe eight to 10 babies would go on a ship and they would be adopted to American couples. Us young girls was raped by lay people, by clergy, by people coming in to visit, people that was helping, and the nuns and the clergy knew what was going on. They said they didn't, but they did because the nuns would take the children out of their beds at night time and bring them down to the priest's office. Why would you take a child out of their bed at two o'clock in the morning to, to give it to a priest in the office? Close the door and walk away. So they knew what they were doing. It's not that they didn't know what they were doing, they did know what they were doing. The children that was adopted into American families obviously taught to a certain age that they were American and they were born in America. But they weren't, they were actually born in Ireland. Because when a baby was born, a man and woman would come from America, maybe to pick the baby or the baby would be sent to them. And what would happen was, the nuns would put the, the man and woman's name on the baby's birth certificates. So the, the, the people would get the baby at a few days old so as far as anybody was concerned, that that lady that adopted the baby had given birth to the baby herself. Not one person that I ever knew wanted to give their baby up for adoption. Their babies was taken off them. After a mother reared in it for so many days or so, some of them reared them for eight months, that the nuns just came in one day, got the girls to dress the babies and they were just taken straight off them. And they never seen them again. The youngest girl I, I knew to have a baby in the homes was 12. This is my opinion, that might not be everybody's opinion. People likes gossip. People thrives on, on gossip and talk and lies. They don't want to see the good part of me or anybody else. They want to see the bad part because we're a nation of begrudgers and we thrive on bad news. Bad news is great to everybody. Good news, nobody wants to hear good news about any, any, anybody, really. A 
and I used to write um, a lot of poetry about the inner child. But when I was writing it, I didn't realise that I was writing about an inner child until later on with my counsellor that I understood. I was writing about me as a child. My child. Me. All the anger, all the sadness. And it was like, there was a child inside me trying to get out. And I suppose the only way that that could happen was just to write it down. Well, when I went to, to Kilmacud at first, I was only a small little girl and I was brought down by, by my father and a nun. And I was brought into this big room and you know the usual and la 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 and I was number 22. But as the, the days and weeks went on, the, the, there was a rectory in room. And if you were having a visitor, you went and sat in the room and every Sunday I used to go and sit in the room to get my, to, to have my visitor, which I thought was my mum. And you know, you're sitting on, I was sitting on the table and I was only a small little thing. I was sitting on the table and you know, your heart pumping, pump, 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 because I was waiting on my mum to come in the door and after she'd bring me home and everything would be all right. But she didn't come anyway, because she wasn't allowed to come. My father forbid her. But anyway, she did write me a few letters, but I didn't get the letters until the police inquiry some years ago, and I never knew they were there. And she had written them to me when I was nine, but they're in the book. And um, other stuff I never got back, but they were, they were only material things. Anyway, the letters was very important. But my mama died. What, what good were the letters? The nuns giving me the letters then. Well, there's no phones in heaven. I couldn't ring and say, Mom, I got your letters, like... The nun told me that, the Reverend Mother told me that my mum was coming to see me. And I said, my mum's coming every Sunday, but she never comes. Well, she said, she's definitely coming this Sunday and she's coming with her neighbour, which my neighbour two doors up. So she did come to see me and I always remember her. She had, and I think my brother has a photograph of it because she wore the same coat when he was making his communion. She had a green kind of a patch, a kind of a, a greeny box coat and she always wore a scarf in them days they all wore a scarf and she came in to see me with our neighbour with my with my mum's friend who was our neighbour and oh I was delighted and she was hugging me but it was always a nun in the room you couldn't say I couldn't say mum they're, they're beating me up they're being mean to me I'm, I'm getting beaten I'm, I'm made wash I'm made clean I'm made scrub floors you couldn't say anything like that because there was always a nun there which I thought my mum had come home, I had come to, to, to take me. You know, all this innocent, all excited and right. She, I'd say she was allowed, I, she brought me a doll, and I still have the doll inside. It's, the doll is actually, Laura is the doll's name, it's in the book. And she brought me a doll, and I already had a doll, I don't know where I got it, but I had an old raggedy doll, rag doll. Um, I didn't bring it in with me, because I remember it was a, a book with a duck on I brought in with me. It was taken off me, I was clapped over the head and I never seen the book again by the nun. No time for tears here. And um, she came to see me anyway and I was delighted to see her and I was delighted to see my neighbour, which when I was very, very small, about five I would have played with her daughter. So I was delighted thinking, I really didn't know why I was there in the first place. Do you know, I knew what I had said and what I told was going on. But I really didn't know why I was in this big prison. Really, in a child's mind, I didn't. All I wanted to do was get home. And when you're in a panic, how can I describe it? It's like if you're in an airplane that told you there's a bomb on it. There's nothing you can do. It's going to blow up. You get this, this, this panic inside you. It's like, you think your heart is going to burst, but that was the way my heart was every Sunday, every Sunday. And then when my mum did finally came, come, I was delighted to see her and she was hugging me and she brought me this doll, Laura. I think she said she bought it. She bought it in Paris supermarket. That's where she bought it, in Kildalkin, because she said it to me. 
that name has gone probably 30, 40 years. But um, sure, I thought I was going home, I had my coat and all on me and to go home. But I wasn't. And I remember my mum turning away. And she was so heartbroken. So heartbroken. She had all these buttons. There were different colour buttons in, in her coat. And I remember her friend was standing beside her. And the nun kept saying, your mother has to go, your mother has to go. Of course, my mother thought I was being looked after. Little did she know that her child was being beaten senseless. So oh, the nun pulled me off her. I was hanging on to her. And the nun pulled me off her. And as she went to go out the door, I always remember it. When I draw my last breath, I'll always remember it. She turned around, my mum looked so sad. And I went to grab her again, the nun grabbed me. But then, just as I let go of her coat, my mum turned around and I grabbed her coat here. And the nun was had me around the waist and she was pulling me and pulling me. And my mum started crying and she was upset. And she, the nun pulled me that hard that all the buttons just came flying out of her coat. My hand went down and all the buttons just came flying out of her coat. And it was the worst thing in my life. But they were all just like smarties dropping on the ground. And I knew then. I probably wouldn't see her again for years. I hate smarties. And she was heartbroken. So, that was my most thing, I, I think. Yeah. Everything gone. That's life, and you just have to get on with it. Funny. Never leave my mind that particular thing. Never. It's just like I was. I was so. My will was so strong. I wasn't letting her out there without me. And all the buttons was just popping on the floor like Smarties, and they were coloured buttons. And that's why they remind me of Smarties. I hate Smarties. I hate them. I wouldn't have a box of Smarties in my house. And I wouldn't even buy them for my grandchildren. Anyway. That's what was done to us. You know, so I spent then the next maybe 15, 20 years going to psychiatrists and counselling and to get my life back on track. Which, yeah, I didn't do too bad. But I'm still living with my demons and I live with them every day of the week. I have more good memories now as an adult than I ever have had as a child. Well, I know, how can you change a bad situation? How can you make somebody love you? How can you make somebody care for you? How can you make somebody want you? You can't, it has to come from you, inside your, inside you, your heart. I don't blame God, I mean, people, says oh god gave me this illness and god did this and only for god god didn't do anything god gave us all free will and free mind and it's up to you and i do firmly believe that there's a mother Teresa and there's a hitler in me and everybody else that's out there and it's what road you take is i could take the hitler road if i want to i don't want to i'm not saying i took the mother Teresa road either because I'm not perfect. The most important thing for me in life is God, because he's controlling my life. I don't have any control in my life. Peace in the world would be very important to me. Have peace in the world and calm and everybody to care about each other and help each other. Well, look, in all fairness, am I afraid of that? Um, no, I'm not. But I would more miss all my friends. I'd miss Sharon, I'd miss the children. I miss the people that really cares and 
and loves me because a lot of people love me and I love a lot of people. Those people I've mentioned has taught me a lot in life. And I can truly say now that I know how to love, I know how to care, I know how to forgive, and I know how to be a kind and decent person. And I suppose at the end of the day, I'm afraid they won't have a smoking area. You know, to smoke. <laughs> like it'd be awful if I went up there to the pearly gates and St. Peter said, I'm sorry you can't smoke in here. What would I do then?